turn to Nehemiah chapter 4. We're in a series that I just started spur of the moment that I called Flood. And I thought instead of making the flood something despicable or something we didn't want to think about or deal with, why don't we just use it as the springboard to give God glory and see what he might say at a moment like this. So I told Brad, generate me a meme with the word flood on it, show a city flooded out, and let's hear what God has to say on this subject. So, so I want to begin to share with you some things that I feel like the Lord spoke to me out of Nehemiah. You know, as he was creating that meme, which is now up on the screen, as you know, this year was the year of loving what God loves, and all of the series were going to start with, I love something. We, we did, I love my Bible, I love my church, I love my neighbor, I love my family. But I just didn't think I love a flood. Was, I, I, th I thought that was maybe pushing it a little too far. So we're just going to call it flood, but there's something you can love in the middle of a flood. Because we do love God's will, right? Absolutely we do. And I am unashamed that God is using a flood uh, to talk to us, not in judgment, but rather in great possibility. Because you know what God's doing? Let me tell you one of the things he's doing in a flood. He's knitting together some pastors, Pastors Denham and Pastors Baird. He's, he's knitting us together. He's knitting our congregations together. And he's doing this through a flood. So let's, let's be sure we see and have eyes to see what God is doing in this particular regard. Last week, as you'll recall, and I encourage you, if you didn't get a chance to listen, I felt like I had a prophetic word that I shared last week that I entitled God's Word in a Flood. And uh, if you didn't get a chance, you can go to YouTube and uh, listen to that because I feel like there were some things that uh, maybe God was saying that was helpful and insightful. But I ended, remember, with those three R's. How many of you remember the three R's from last Sunday. Can you say them together? What was the first R? Remember. remember. I hear it. We're to remember. More is going on at this moment than what we see with our natural eyes. Remember that. Remember that when natural disaster happens and things of this nature come our way, remember that something more is happening than what you see. Remember that. Number two, what was it? Refuse. Refuse. Refuse to quit. Refuse to be discouraged. Refuse to receive doubts. Refuse to receive naysaying. Refuse. We can't control much in life, but we can control what we, what we choose to do. And so we refuse to throw in the towel and we refuse to quit. And finally, number three was what? Receive. We're to receive the mantle to be a standard. We are the standard. Listen, when you've been flooded out, as, as Doug mentioned, when you've been flooded out three times, listen, people are watching. And this becomes a moment that they'll either see your discouragement or they'll see the standard of God being lifted high. And so this is the, our moment. People don't, look, people don't watch you when life is going well. They watch you when you're challenged. And when they watch, watch you walk through a challenge... Uh, being able to say God is more than enough. There's something that touches their heart in that regard. So last week we shared on these particular things, and I believe times like this that my job as pastor is to be like a son of Issachar, and it's to help you understand the times and know what we ought to do, kind of untangle the mess. So for me, the flood is practice really for greater anarchy and chaos that could be coming to the earth. Listen, we better understand how to get through times like these because right now, as, as our president has called uh, Kim Jong-un rocket man, rocket man right now has at his fingertips nuclear weapons. Now, God forbid he would push one of those buttons. And I don't know how much you think about this, but, I, but, but, you know, there's a part of me that says he can't be that crazy. But then there's another part of me that thinks he's just that crazy. And, if he's, and even if he can't hit the mainland of the United States, if he hits Japan or Hawaii or South Korea or any one of our allies, we're in the middle of a nuclear exchange. 
and you think a flood was bad, if you think a flood was inconvenient, if you think 50 cent raise in gas prices was just unbelievable to you, then, then, then let me tell you, you're not ready for what's ready to come. So these are moments that we are being trained, I think, and prepared in order to handle these challenging moments. I don't want it to happen. I'm praying God that he intervenes and that saner, cooler heads prevail. But I'm just telling you, uh, it would not, somewhere in history, whether it's my generation or another generation, somebody's going to be crazy enough to get something really stupid started. And uh, hopefully there'll be a church that's prepared to weather that and respond to that. And so uh, I feel like that's a part of my job with you all. But today, I want to share for these few moments that we have together a message in this flood series I entitled, Why Rebuild? Why Rebuild? And in the book of Nehemiah, chapter 4, uh, if, I, I'm going to read some of this, but I'm not going to read it all because 23 verses would be a, a, a long time and we had so many announcements that had to be made. But I want to read just a few verses here in Nehemiah chapter 4. And it, it would only be befitting in the book of Nehemiah because this is when Ezra opened up the book of the law and he began to read. And he read the law for six hours as the people stood and the people wept as he read for six hours. Now, I'm not going to read for six hours. I may read for 60 seconds. You can stand for that long as we honor God's word, right? So let's stand together, if you're in Nehemiah chapter 4, in reverence to God's word. And let me read just a few passages as we get started with the message, Why Rebuild? Nehemiah chapter 4. But so it happened when Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, that he was furious and very indignant and mocked the Jews. And he spoke before his brethren and the army of Samaria and said, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they fortify themselves? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they complete it in a day? Will they revive the stones from the heaps of rubbish, stones that are burned? Now Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him and he said, whatever they build, even if a fox goes up on it, he will break down their stone wall. Hear, O God, for we are despised. Now we're listening again, I believe, to Nehemiah beginning to pray. Turn their reproach on their own heads and give them as plunder to a land of captivity. Do not cover their iniquity and do not let their sins be blotted out before you, for they have provoked you to anger before the builders. So we built the wall and the entire wall was joined together up to half its height for the people had a mind to work. And I'll stop there, but I'll be using the whole chapter making note of that as we talk about why rebuild. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. May you be seated. Thank you. Now, Nehemiah is a story I think that's familiar to most of the folks in the room. Uh, just by way of quick review, I may mention to you that the Jews had been uh, defeated and had been taken off into captivity by the Babylonians and they had been sitting in captivity at the time of Nehemiah for about 70 years. At the time of their captivity, Babylon had come to Jerusalem and Babylon had destroyed the city of Jerusalem. They laid it to waste and they literally knocked down the wall that had surrounded the city down to its very foundation. That's called raised, R-A-Z-E-D. They raised the city and they raised the wall. That doesn't mean they built it up. It means they knocked it straight to the ground. And so they had so utterly destroyed this and it had been sitting there for 70 years that by the time Nehemiah comes along and he gets this burden to rebuild the wall, there's a lot of talk that's going on, not only amongst his enemies, but even amongst the people of God as to whether or not it should even be rebuilt. In fact, many people were saying this seems to be futile. I mean, it was knocked down. Our enemies knocked it down. They, they totally destroyed it. There's nothing left of it. Uh, if we try to raise it up again, it's simply going to be laid to rubble again. It really seems to be a futile 
thing to want to go in there and to rebuild this wall. In fact, the Persians eventually would come along with a greater king and a greater army, and they would defeat the Babylonians. And so the Jews, who were in a type of slavery captivity with the Babylonians, were now to be transferred over to the Persians. And so they became literally the slaves, the captives of the Persians, because the Persians ended up defeating the Babylonians. Now, the same thing uh, would have been going through people's minds. They said, well, if the Babylonians destroyed the wall and the Babylonians wouldn't let us rebuild, how much more would a stronger army keep us from building? This whole rebuilding the wall stuff seems to be rather futile. It's interesting as I share that with you and I began to think about that and God spoke to me about that because my wife Trace right now is going to real estate school. We've been talking about uh, what we need to do kind of to position our lives and do some things in our life. And, and I might also say that, that I've got some things to share in the near future about Bonhoeffer that'll blow you away. Uh, there's some things in the background that are blow you away cool going on with the Bonhoeffer Institute. So I'm excited. I can't tell it to you now. I'm, there, you know, all these people I work with are attorneys. And, and they all send you these emails. And on the email, at the bottom of the email, that says, if you say anything or pass this email on, we will sue the lights out of you. And we will, you know, so I can't, you can't ever say anything that comes through this, but it's just exciting stuff. I can say that. But my wife right now, it just felt a heart to, to reactivate her real estate license. She sold real estate years ago and, and was really pretty successful at it. And, and has thought, hey, I might like to try and do that again and, and do that as sort of a side light and side income. And so she's going to school right now, and she was in school, and uh, Doug, you're, you're going to be interested in this, that, that she sat down with a guy at real estate school, and they began talking. Of course, you start talking with each other as to what you do in life, and she told him about us, and, and, then, and they found out that the guy is a member at Crosstown right there on the same property. Isn't it a small area? So he's a member of Crosstown, and so they got in this whole conversation about the flood. And uh, so they were talking back and forth about the flood, and uh, she was sharing some things, and he was sharing some things. And it was interestingly, uh, as they were visiting, and this isn't a negative thing, it's just something that goes through people's minds. So I don't want it to reflect negatively, it was just something in his mind, because he's gone through, apparently, the same amount of floods you all have gone through. And in his mind, his words were exactly what you kind of see going on here. How many times are you flooded out before you kind of say, is this futile? That's kind of what was spinning in his brain. And I understand when you're going, you're going, well, because you, you, you got a, the right spirit. But in a, in a normal, natural mind, isn't that what you'd say? I mean, how many times does the enemy knock you out before you quit saying that may not be the best thing to do? How many times... Does the wall get knocked down and that's not the thing to do? How many times do waters come in and maybe that's not the thing to do? So the question comes up, why rebuild? Why rebuild? Why put it together when destruction seems inevitable? In fact, why would God ask that? Is it not true some of you have attended the meetings in our city with regards to that whole area in West Ashley, I know Pastor Brad was there, some of you others may have attended the meeting over at the Citadel Mall with regards to the recommendations that are coming from the city as to what to do with that particular area. And as I recall you saying, Brad, there's been like a dozen meetings. I didn't know there was that many meetings, but you said there were like a dozen meetings that had taken place. And, and through this listening tour, you begin to hear people obviously express their concerns, they're expressing their outrage over what may have been a governmental mistake in this particular area. Some of them are wanting compensations, all of them wanting it fixed, but some of them say, why should we even rebuild? It's really an interesting question. Why do this? Why rebuild if you are fighting the inevitable? or what appears to be the inevitable. Now, Nehemiah's issue wasn't a flood, but it was no less frustrating. It seemed no less inevitable. To rebuild the walls appeared to be inviting the same set of events which occurred that took out the wall to simply take place again. So why do you do this? 
You know, there's an old French saying, I used to think it was Chinese, but as I found out it's a French saying, that's really pretty revelational, and it's this. He who spits in the wind spits in his own face. Isn't that revelational? He who spits in the wind spits in his own face. What, is, what does that mean? It means there are some things that are futile. If you stick your head out the window and you spit, it's, it's not going to affect anybody but you. And so there are times it feels like when you're doing something, it's like spitting into the wind. All of you have felt that way. Well, you felt that way sometimes in relationships. Really? I'm going to go back and try to make this relationship work? It seems like I'm spitting into the wind. Why am I doing that which seems futile? Why, do I, why, why am I going back into it when it seems futile? Why, why, why? Well, let me give you the short answer, and maybe it could be the short sermon. Maybe it's because God said do it. Boy, that cuts sermon time down, doesn't it? Why would you do it? Because God said so. Oh, okay. There you go. Amen. Let's all go home. Now, listen to me. Rebuilding for Nehemiah wasn't spitting in the wind. And to do what we're doing in order to renovate and one more time put the bees ferry location back into operating order isn't spitting into the wind it's doing what God has asked us to do because there's something God is wanting to say now I put down here what did the wall represent to those that were looking at it now this isn't the same I spoke last Sunday about some of the things I think a flood says or speaks so, so that's out there. But I want to talk just for a moment about Nehemiah and, and, and the futility of rebuilding this wall and why it was so important that despite those feelings, they did it anyway. What did the wall represent? What's the big deal about that wall? It's kind of like, what's the, what's the big deal about that church? What's the big deal about that location? Why, why would that be of, of interest or why would that be of significance? Why, why was Nehemiah so burdened about a wall? And is that analogous to maybe what God is saying to all of us as we look at what we're attempting to do down at that location we're all going to settle into? The wall, interestingly, had at least four significant features to it that were important to God to be communicated. Number one was this, protection. A wall represented protection. It represented uh, a place that enemies could not get through. It represented a place where you felt safety. It represented a place where there was a sense of peace. Protection. Obviously, in those days, a wall uh, was an impenetrable place. And so when the walls were built around Jerusalem, it was a protected place. The same could be said of a church. Everyone needs a protected place. A church should be a place of protection, a place where the enemy can't get in, a place of peace, a place where you can say there's safety here, there's rest here. And, and, and so I think there's some analogies that we can make in that regard. But that was one of the reasons why God said, I want those walls rebuilt. He put the burden on Nehemiah. It's because I want my people to know that there's a place of protection. Number two is this, that there's a place of promise. Kingdom life and kingdom precept is more than theory. There has to be reality to the things we say. In other words, we can preach healing but if nobody gets healed, it's just theory, right? But when we preach healing, we believe there's reality to that. Are you following me? It's, it's more than just being encouraged. Being a believer is more than just theory. It's more than just precept. There's, there's some substance to it. There's, there's real promise to it. And the reason God said rebuild the wall was because there needed to be a tangible expression a place where people could point to and say there the promise exists. Just like when you preach healing, there comes a moment that you have to say, hey, hey folks, I've been preaching healing. Come here, let me show you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna call people's names out. I'm gonna call out like someone like Linda Rutledge right there. She, I'm gonna say, hey, God, God did some things in your life, hasn't he? He's done some things in your life. Sure he has. 
So I'm preaching healing, and let me tell you, I can point to somebody that knows something about that. And that's what God wanted the walls rebuilt. He said, there's a promise that exists in my people, and there's got to be a place I can point that out. That's number two. Number three is presence. God always resides geographically. Now, we all know God's here. He's there. He's in this place. He's at the church down the street. He's on the other side of the globe. God can be anywhere and everywhere at the same time, and we understand that. But there is a sense of manifested presence where God's Spirit shows up in a manifested, tangible, specific, important way, and the walls represented uh, that aspect of location that God dwelt. God has an address, and that would be his address. And, and therefore, people can point again and say, hey, you know, God is amongst those people. God dwells in that place. And then the fourth reason God wanted the walls rebuilt, I believe, is under the word paradox. Paradox is simply something that, that appears to be one way, but it's actually another way. It appears as if building the walls would be futile, but actually it's the most important thing they could do. It appears as if it would just be teeing it up for the enemy for him to come and destroy something again, but in actuality, it was God teeing it up for his purposes in order to establish his people once again. All of these things with regards to a wall become analogous to why I believe God says we're to restore and to rebuild because there is a promise, there is a paradox, there is a presence, and there is a protection that exists even on that lot on 1945 Bees Ferry. Hear me when I say this. You can say whatever you want. There is something that God is saying at this moment that if we will hear it, as silly as it might sound to the world or anyone else who looks at it, I'm telling you that there's something significant that God is wanting to do in order that he might accentuate his plans and his purposes in a group of people that are sold out to him. And I'll say amen to that if no one else will. And this is why voices mocked Nehemiah. Sanballat and Tobiah. They came along and they mocked Nehemiah. Why are you rebuilding? <laughs> I can't even tell you. I, I don't know how you guys have done this for the third time. It's just amazing the perseverance I respect so much. But I've had private messages. Why? Why would you, Kevin, locate? there why would you guys even consider renovating why 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 that's sand ballot and tobiah talk why i'm not listening to sand ballot and tobiah i will listen to what god has said sand ballot and tobiah are types of mockers and discouragers and general defilers Whenever you do something that is outside of the box, hear me when I say this, Sanballat and Tobiah were actually fairly pragmatic. They were reasonable, pragmatic thinkers. And you do something out of the box of pragmatism and, and logical reasoning and people get shaky because everybody believes that God must be logical and that God must be reasonable and that God always does things that make sense to us. Isn't that true? That's how we treat the Lord. If God puts something, if something comes before you and it seems unreasonable or illogical, how many of you, are, the first thing you say, that must be God? I don't know that many people do that. Usually when something unreasonable or illogical comes in front of us, usually the first thing we say is, no way, that's unreasonable and illogical. But how many of you know that there's a lot of things in God's word that are illogical and unreasonable? How many of you know that? How many of you know that sometimes God asks you, I can quote passages, you know some of my favorite passages. Abraham, in order to receive an inheritance, went to a land that he knew not, not knowing where he was going. That's really reasonable, isn't it? He takes a trip packs up his family, he goes out on the road, just starts driving. People are saying, hey, Abe, where are you headed? I don't know. Where are you going? I'll know when I get there. 
Really? Why are you doing it? God told me to do it. You're weird. That's Bible. I, I, I mean, I could go down the list of weird, unusual, unusual, unreasonable things. Now, I'm not saying we, we always do the unreasonable because it must, has to always be God. I'm not saying that. That's why you pray. That's why you have discernment. These, these are all things that fit into evaluating circumstances. But the church has lost its ability to fearlessly walk in faith and to fearlessly obey. We've lost this element of our lives. We're too busy building our pros and our cons and figuring out if it works logically. And we're so busy trying to make it reasonable. And if it's reasonable, then we'll vote, yes, it must be God. we got to break that. Sometimes God says, build on a floodplain. Are you hearing me? Sometimes God says, build a wall. If the whole world stands against you, Nehemiah, build the wall. Oh, it's a great story to read, isn't it? But boy, it's hard to live. That's how most of the Bible is. It's great to read. It's just hard to implement. You know, we love the stories. They really speak to us. But now I got to live it. Now God's asking us to live something like that. Go rebuild in that place that everybody's looking at you saying it's going to flood again. Well, it may. I don't know. It may. It could next week for all we know. But hear me when I say this. God's saying something. It's like Noah building an ark, telling the people it's going to rain, and they're going, what's rain? Because it never rained before. Could you imagine? Yeah, it's going to rain. What's rain? Well, it's water falling from the sky. Can you watch everybody go, water falling from the sky? That's a good one, Noah. Water's never fallen from the sky. Noah says, well, it's about to. Yeah, yeah, Noah. Yeah, you know Noah. That's Noah. Yeah, that's a man of God. Is it going to be a people of God? Sandballot and Tobias. Sandballot, it's interesting. He, he reasons... Sam Ballot does with, with a number of things. He says, well, uh, are they feeble? In other words, they don't have energy or resources. They're feeble. He says, will they fortify themselves? So, so he's critiquing them on their expertise. Can they do the work themselves? Can they develop it or plan it? So he's critiquing their expertise. He says, well, what are they going to do? Are they going to present sacrifices? And so he's critiquing their worship practice. Who's going to worship there? It's a bad place to have a church. He says, can they complete it in a day? He's criticizing the length of time it's going to take in order for this rebuild to take place. And then finally, he says, what are they going to do? Revive the stones or recapture the glory days? So he begins just to throw these criticisms at them. And then Tobiah, I always laugh at Tobiah because Tobiah is like this really annoying sidekick of Sanballat. You know, it's like Tobias is hanging around Sandbelt, and Sandbelt is giving his reasoned, you know, uh, critique of what Nehemiah is trying to do, and he's very reasoned, Sandbelt is, and then Tobias is just this kind of crazy little sidekick, and it's like he's going, yeah, 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 what he said, what he said, and even if the fox jumps on it, it'll all fall apart. I mean, like, what? That's stupid. It's like, you ever read that? I read that, and I go, that's just like a stupid thing to say. It's like, Tobias, just go back under your rock somewhere. Tobiah, Sandballot. You can hear them, what they're saying. They don't need to build a wall. We need to build a Persian shopping center. That's what we need to do, a Persian mall. That's what we need to build. But Nehemiah was resolute. He says, we will rebuild the wall. And he began to do this in several ways. I'm going to give this quickly. I'm just sowing some things just to keep our focus. And aren't, you, and aren't you glad? It, isn't this not amazing? Two Sundays is all we were out. That's amazing, when it could have been four. So God's involved. But this is what Nehemiah did. Number one, the first thing he did was pray. Now, I want to tell you something about his prayer. Um, his prayer was imprecatory in nature. And what that word means is, is that he was praying that God would just smite them. That's what an imprecatory prayer is. And we don't pray those prayers much anymore. You will find them in the Psalms. Psalm 18, Psalm 35 are imprecatory Psalms. 
Imprecatory is when you know you have an enemy, you know they're, they're thwarting you to the will of God, and you begin to pray that God would... It's basically an imprecatory prayer is God sick them. That's what an imprecatory prayer is. Sick them. Now, I know we don't think this way, but the scripture has these particular prayers. And so he begins to pray. He goes, let their, let their transgression come upon their head. Let, let them, let them uh, Lord, you know, be buried under this iniquity. And he's just, he just begins to pray that way. Why, why would you pray that way? I'm not, listen, those, those that would curse and thwart the will of God, I'm not going to say God bless them. I'm not saying God bless Kim Jong-un. I don't, I don't want him, no, I don't want the guy that's going to push a nuclear button to be blessed. I want him, I want him he, either he gets delivered from his devils or let him be taken out by an assassin <laughs> in Jesus' name <laughs> with the love of God. <laughs> Why? Because he's going to kill my kids and my grandkids. That's what he wants to do. That's not God's will. I hope he gets delivered. So maybe I'll spend more time on that. But I'm just telling you, there comes a moment when you get before God and you say, God, this is thwarting the will of God. This is not your will. These people are actually assigned to stop the will of God. Lord, I'm, I'm not normally like this, but I'm just telling you, then let the weight of your judgment fall upon their heads. I know we aren't used to that. This is a new season. And the, and the new season is we're going to have to learn how to pray in such a way that looses, looses God and the, and the... See, God is perfect, perfect love. God is perfect love and he's perfect justice. Perfect. God's the only one that knows how much love and how much justice gets dispensed in a situation. He's perfect mercy and he's perfect grace. Perfect. But he's also perfect judgment. He's perfect in all of his ways and all of his attributes. And in that perfection, he moves and he knows exactly what to do at exactly the right moment. And that's what Nehemiah begins to pray. So I'm just telling you, anybody, anybody that starts sand balloting, I'm just going to start, Lord, we love him, we care about him, but they're, they're thwarting the will of God. So zip their lip in Jesus' name. Secondly, Nehemiah begins to put into motion practical vision principle. Now, what do I mean by that? When you're hearing voices or when you're hearing things that are saying, hey, give it up, throw in the towel, it's time to quit, you're being stupid, silly, illogical, irrational. This is what he looked at the people and he began to do. And I'm just going to read this really quickly. He looked at the people and he said, here's how you quit all of this. You put your hand to something. You start putting your hand to the work again. So hear me when I say this. We're going to have days, we probably at the end of this week, we're going to have to get chairs put in there. We, we may have to clean up just a little bit, help clean up. You heard Doug mention that he could use some hands maybe through the weekend. Uh, we're going to have to roll our sleeves up and do some work on some of this and be out there. Now, I'm finally settled. I'm glad for that. So I'm going to have to roll my sleeves up and I'm going to have to get involved. But let me tell you, when you lay your hand to something, you don't hear as much yeah, yeah around you. When you put your hand to the work. In fact, if it's important to you, you will invest some sweat into it. I'm glad if you write a check. We can always use all the checks we can get. But if you invest some sweat into the work, it's, a, it's amazing how meaningful it becomes. And let me tell you, vision, I'm finding out, and I appreciate Doug and his, his men. We couldn't absolutely do it without these guys. They are critically important, but vision cannot always be contracted out. Sometimes we've got to arise, and the people that went to rebuild the wall were not just skilled contractors. They were families who maybe they didn't know how to paint really well. Maybe they didn't know how to clean really well. Maybe they didn't know certain things as well as skilled people do. But Nehemiah said, you're going to have to roll up your sleeves, and you're going to have to get your buckets. And not only that, in this chapter, he says, you're going to get a bucket in one hand and work it, and you're going to put a sword in your other hand, and you're going to battle and you're, and you're going to be prepared to battle while you're working. This is what this looks like. And, and, and it's because God's plan is always contended for. There is a plan. That location has a plan. There's been prophecies spoken over that area for years, decades. 
I'm telling you, it's being contended for. These are the days of contending. And the question is whether there will be the remnant who will say, yes, we will arise and we will build and we will battle for the plans and the purposes of God, not just for our conveniences. That's good preaching. So they prayed. They had practical vision. They persevered. In other words, they didn't give up. And then finally, they did it number four. Three was perseverance. And then number four was progeny. Nehemiah said these words at the end of the chapter, chapter four. He said, he said you are doing this. You are building and you are fighting. I'm, I'm synopsizing what he said in this chapter. He said, you are building and you are fighting, not for you alone, but for your neighbors, for your sons, for your daughters, for your wives, and for your households. Why do we do all of this? Why don't we just throw in the towel and why don't we all just quit and why don't we just, I mean, there's 10,000 churches we all could go to. Why don't we just quit and just go find somewhere else and just, just take the joy train with most of America? Why? It's because we're not doing this for us alone. We are doing this for a progeny. We're doing this for a generation that's coming behind us that God has lined up that he wants to send to us in order that we might pass along our Christian faith. Not just our Christian faith, but allow me to say our distinctives in our Christian faith. My job as a dad, this is what I did. I have three children, and, and I'm just telling the story. I not only passed my Christian faith on to my children, I passed on my spirit-filled, charismatic, Pentecostal ways to my kids. My tree is not going to be some dead-headed religious bunch. My family tree is going to be on fire, believing God, signs and wonders, tongue-talking, devil-chasing, Bible-believing Christians if I have anything to do with it. That's my legacy. Legacy is not bricks and mortar. Legacy is not the building we sit in. These things may have their place, but that's not your legacy. Your legacy isn't dirt and soil. Your legacy is what you invest in people's lives. Your legacy is what you impart. Your legacy is what you leave behind you. You need to start thinking less about what's in your attic and what's in your bank account and think about how you're leaving your faith to those that are going to walk it out when you're dead and six foot under. I think an anointing to preach hit me. I love you. I do. That's why I'm telling you the truth. And the truth is that God's calling us to rebuild this in order that we have the tools to affect generations that will come behind us. Charleston needs revival. Charleston needs an outpouring. Charleston just needs a foundation of scriptural truth. I'm not saying we're the only ones but I am saying we are some of the ones who have been asked to leave that behind. And God is doing the most paradoxical thing I've ever seen. He's saying, go do it in a flood zone. Now the question is whether or not you're going to believe a sand ballad or whether you will believe a Nehemiah. Now I believe most of you all of you, I have confidence of this, would say, God's up to something here. And I want to be a part of that. I do too. Why rebuild? Because God's up to something so big. And I just don't want to miss it. Do you? No, I didn't think you did. So let's, let's along with Nehemiah, let's do what we need to do to see what God can do. Hallelujah. Father, I pray right now in the name of Jesus that you would uh, just speak to us in these moments that our excitement isn't just in the fact that we're going to get sheetrock on the wall this week. That's exciting, but it's not the excitement. The excitement is, is that, Lord, we're going to get to see you begin to do some things that only you can do. I pray, Lord, that 
you'd help us keep our eyes on you, that there are paradoxical things that are happening at this very moment that will only make sense maybe another 10 years from today. But we'll look back and we'll say, can you, can you believe what we were thinking in, in those days back in 2017 and look at what God you'd done? And that's amazing. And the only way it can be explained is you. And I'm praying, Lord, that all of us would just maintain our sight upon you, would maintain our hearts towards you, would just, would just Lord, continue to anticipate and expect and believe for miracles to take place. Lord, you've already started some miracles. I know some things that are going on in the background that I can't even share, but Lord, I'm praying that, that somehow all of us, what, whatever we can share, can't share, whatever we know or don't know, but that Lord, ultimately our trust is in you. And I pray right now, Lord, you would do that for all of us. Continue to knit our hearts together. We know that there are two tribes here and that we're slowly knitting, we're slowly learning, we're slowly loving, we're slowly walking and, and all of these things are good and right. And I think some of it, some of it, Lord, can happen at a deeper level when we just sort of roll up our sleeves and we stick our hands in some dirt and we say we're just going to rebuild and we're all going to do it together. I believe something can happen that would knit us for the next season of your unprecedented move. So, Lord, we love you in that regard and we appreciate you and we want to be on board. Release the fullness of your